Professors, who was the dumbest student you ever had and what was so dumb about them? I'm not a professor, but I was paired with another student during our fourth year of pharmacy school rotations. This student, whom we'll call M, displayed a surprising lack of knowledge. Our student room at the hospital, where six of us worked in assignments and projects, was decorated with a mix of meme posters for our preceptor and motivational posters. One poster featured whales breaching the ocean. M suddenly exclaimed one quiet afternoon that the poster was so incredibly silly. Why are whales at the top of the water? They don't breathe air. Curious asked him what he meant, and he insisted that whales were fish and therefore breathed water, not air. We tried to correct him by explaining that whales are mammals, like dolphins, but M disagreed, saying that anything that swims in the water is a fish. I decided to test his knowledge further by asking about penguins. He responded that penguins are just too foolish to realize they can fly, and that all birds fly. When I brought up ostriches as an example of flightless birds, he claimed they were just bird-like mammals. When I asked about bats, he confidently stated they were clearly birds. This went on for about 15 minutes until another student asked him how he passed basic biology and comparative anatomy, both of which are required for pharmacy school. M revealed that he took these classes online and paid his sister, who was in medical school, to complete the assignments and exams for him. This revelation explained a lot. M was known for asking very basic questions, such as what such medications are used for, even after lectures on allergy medications that covered the topic. Our entire class of about 200 future pharmacists was always puzzled by how he managed to get into our school. M was supposed to review patient charts with me for ICU rounds, but instead, he was busy shopping for a private plane he planned to buy after graduation. He intended to work in a state that needed pharmacists while living elsewhere and commuting by plane. Another time, M was removed from a subsequent rotation site for inappropriate behavior, involving a physician's car and engaging in activities not permitted in a hospital campus. This happened not once, but three times. The first two times, the physician was understanding, but the third time, M was banned from the hospital grounds and failed the rotation. M walked across the stage with us at graduation, but he didn't receive a diploma that day, partly due to the incident at his rotation site and his history of not following academic integrity guidelines during exams. There was some drama within our graduating class because we felt that if he wasn't graduating, he shouldn't walk with us especially since we all knew what had happened at his rotation site and he had been reported multiple times for not adhering to academic standards. However, the university allowed him to walk, reasoning that he paid his tuition and his family was there to see him. About a week after graduation, M posted in our class Facebook group, asking if there was a way to sue the university or the federal government or loan holders to forgive his loan, as he had decided he no longer wanted to be a pharmacist and wanted to essentially return his education. Can't believe M's sister is in med school and she let him think whales are fish. Did she also tell him that the sky is green and the grass is blue? At this point, I'm convinced M's family tree is more of a family circle and education is just a loose suggestion in their household. I mean, <laughs> who pays someone else to do their assignments and then brags about it? That's like paying someone to go to the gym for you and expecting to get buff. Story 2. I wasn't the professor, but I did speak with her about a particular student during an online class I was taking. Each week, we had to contribute to a discussion board, providing our thoughts on the given topic in our own words. Our responses were visible to everyone, aiming to foster discussion. I put effort into researching and carefully crafting my answers, and I always signed my name at the end, even though our names were already displayed. Without fail, an hour or two after I posted my contribution, a classmate would post hers. She would copy and paste what I had written and present it as her own answer. It was obvious she hadn't even read it, because she left my name at the end. After this happened, I sent an email to our professor to express my concern. She replied, confirming that she had already noticed the issue. The following week, that classmate was no longer listed in the class roster. I was always curious about why someone would pay a significant amount of money just to copy answers without making any effort to learn. This classmate wasn't young either. According to our profile pages, she was at least 20 years older than me. It was a strange and unwise choice. Story 3. I wouldn't describe it as dumb, but it was certainly baffling and annoying. This classmate had somehow made it all the way to college, still believing that an odd and overly exaggerated form of flirting would help her get what she wanted, even with female faculty. It was quite cringeworthy to witness. She would tilt her head to the side, play with her hair, swing her leg back and forth and use a semi-childish way of speaking while glancing up through her eyelashes. It was clear that any conversation with her should only happen in front of others. She confided in me that she was reading and studying every night but still wasn't improving her test scores and asked for help. I explained how to create written study materials to better absorb information. She claimed she had done this and reviewed her materials regularly, yet still wasn't seeing any progress. Genuinely concerned and puzzled, 
I asked her to bring her study materials to the next class so we could go over them together and ensure they were accurate and helpful. She agreed. When the next class came, she announced, with even more exaggerated gestures, that after receiving her latest test score, which she got before our previous conversation, she had thrown her study materials away in a fit of frustration, and they were all gone, as if they had never existed. I looked her in the eye and said, I think you should consider the role that self-discipline might be playing in your grades in my class. She reacted with a huff and a pout, and I never saw her again. What saddens me is that it was clear someone, most likely her family, had taught her that these behaviors were effective. No one sticks to a behavior so firmly unless they've had some success with it. Story 4 During college, I studied modern languages at university and met a girl who had managed to spend an entire year abroad, a compulsory part of the course, living in the country where her language was spoken, working at a job with local people, and sharing a flat with three local people. And after the year was up, her language skills had not improved, and her flatmates had to talk to her in English because she couldn't understand them otherwise. I mean, I fully appreciate that some people find it much harder than others to learn a foreign language. That's not actually the part I find dumb. The dumb part is getting into 30,000 pounds of debt and spending four years of her life in a degree, then putting absolutely zero effort into actually learning the thing you're paying to learn. Actually, to be that bad at the language after a full year, you'd have to make an active effort to avoid it. Never turn on a television or pick up a magazine. Spend all your time in English and Irish-themed pubs and ignore anyone who tried to talk to you. Maybe they were just... Socially awkward? I don't know, man. Story 5. I wasn't a professor, but I did date a girl who wasn't very bright. She was sweet and naive, but I mean, she was genuinely not smart. We played a joke on her, convincing her that cats couldn't see themselves or other cats in mirrors. Her cat was also quite oblivious and never seemed to look at itself in the mirror. So this became a running joke among my friends and me for a while. we have been dating for over a year when we decided to take an astronomy class together. A few weeks into the semester, we broke up and it was a pretty bad breakup. One day, I was sitting at the back of the class and she was way up at the front. We were trying to keep as much distance between us as possible, maintaining a sort of truce for the sake of learning. The professor was discussing advanced telescopes and, being a cat lover, used her cat as an example to explain how one might use a reflecting telescope to see another cat in a spaceship or something similar. It was an introductory class, so she often used these playful examples. The class was mostly bored and lulled by the lecture, but then a small hand raised in the front row. I quickly realized what was about to happen and slid down in my seat. Um, cats can't see reflections, so your example won't work. A smug voice piped up from the front. The professor paused, unsure of what had just been said. At first, she was confused, and she wondered if it was some kind of prank. Once she understood that Max was serious, she made a snarky remark and continued with her lecture. Max spoke up again, not wanting to be dismissed. Then the professor rolled her eyes halfway through her sentence and asked, What are they, vampire cats? The entire class of 200 students erupted in laughter. My ex stood up, gave me a withering glare, and stormed out of the class. Story 6 I'm not a teacher, but there was an incident that made me feel sympathy for my philosophy professor in community college. My professor was a priest, a very patient and easygoing man, but one student really tested his patience. There was a woman who would sit in the front row and constantly fall asleep. When she wasn't asleep, she would argue with him about every major point he made. It was clear she was not very intelligent, and she did this so often that every time she spoke up, the whole class would collectively do the silent grow on an eye roll. She was a mom and rode horses, which she brought up quite often. One memorable moment was when the professor was discussing fulfillment and motivation in jobs that pay well but have unpleasant duties. He was explaining that while anyone could tolerate an awful job for a while for good money, eventually the psychological toll would become too great leading to a desire to quit. She loudly objected and said that if that were true, how could her horse do everything she wanted it to and be happy with just an apple? She literally told the professor he was wrong because her horse is like apples. The professor was at a loss for words at this point. I think he had finally reached his limit. Everyone in class was just flabbergasted. I tried to explain the concept to her, but she just kept insisting it wasn't true because of her horse. Without a doubt, she was the worst classmate I've ever had the misfortune to share a class with. Every day was like that. Perhaps the professor thought a bit more about whether teaching was worth it after that day. Yep, there are moments in life where you question why you're there. If you're enjoying the video, don't forget to hit that subscribe and like button for more videos like this. Story 7 I'm not a professor, but I was a student in my human development class during the first day of college. As usual, the teacher used the first day to review the syllabus. He projected it onto the screen and gave each of us a copy to follow along, which was more than what most professors typically did. He went over the syllabus in quite a bit of detail to ensure we all understood what was expected in the class. Every person in the classroom understood what he was saying and how the syllabus worked, except for one lady. 
She was middle-aged, perhaps a bit older, and for some reason, she had a question about every aspect of the syllabus. Asking a question after every point the teacher made, she even asked questions after the teacher had just explained what she was asking about. He patiently answered her questions, but it was clear he was getting annoyed and suggested she ask any remaining questions at the end of the class. Everyone in the classroom was becoming frustrated with her. Eventually, one student spoke up and pointed out that she was wasting everyone's time by asking questions that the professor had already answered, or that were clearly stated in the syllabus. He suggested she read it carefully before asking any more questions. The lady seemed shocked and offended by this comment and looked at the teacher, as if expecting him to intervene. However, he simply shrugged and agreed with the student, saying, he's right, before continuing the syllabus. After that, she stopped asking questions, and we never saw her again after the first day. Now, I don't like to assume people are unintelligent just because they might be confused about something or have something else going on. At the same time, it's puzzling how someone could keep asking questions that are clearly being explained to them and then get offended when someone points this out. Story 8. I was one of the students in a graduate school seminar that included a student who struggled significantly with language and expression. We were all puzzled by how he had been admitted to the university, let alone the history program. The seminar was a mix of advanced undergraduate and graduate students so not everyone was expected to perform at the same level. But this student's challenges were extreme. It turned out that he had been admitted to the university through a science or engineering program, in which he excelled. His math scores were exceptional, and he had even taken organic chemistry for fun multiple times. However, he didn't want to pursue a career in that field. His true passion was history. So he transferred to the humanities department. His outstanding science grades had overshadowed any concerns about his transfer. Unfortunately, he struggled immensely in the history program. He lacked the necessary vocabulary, syntax, critical thinking, analytical skills, and creativity to pass even an introductory history course, let alone a graduate-level seminar. The professor asked me to help him edit his paper before submission, and I kept a copy because it was so astonishingly incoherent. Everyone felt sorry for him because he was so eager to succeed in the program, but lacked the necessary skills. The last I heard, he'd been transferred back to the science department, where he was thriving. I hope he found happiness and success wherever his academic journey took him. Story 9. Years ago, I worked at the Faculty of Pharmacy at a large Canadian university, where there was a student known for challenging every aspect of her academic experience. It was a running joke that the only way she wouldn't graduate would be if she failed to challenge her graduation requirements. She rarely did any work, never attended classes, and consistently failed every course. However, she would challenge her grades and was given numerous additional chances. For instance, students had to pass a calculations test that involved simple multiplication and division, but they needed to achieve a perfect score. If they didn't, they had to retake the test until they did. She scored 8 out of 10 and challenged the result, arguing that 8 out of 10 is a passing grade and she should be allowed to proceed. She claimed that expecting students to get a perfect score was unfair and unrealistic. The professor explained that if she made such a calculation error in a real-life medication scenario, it could be dangerous, highlighting the necessity for perfection in this context. She engaged in this pattern of behavior repeatedly. It seemed that filing all these challenges must have been more work than simply completing the coursework. To this day, I check the credentials in the walls of any pharmacy I visit to ensure that she isn't the one behind the counter. Story 10 As a graduate student, I taught an introductory astronomy lab course. One semester, I had a student who was not particularly bright. In the first homework assignment, which covered basic physics concepts, there was a question asking why an aircraft carrier floats. His answer was that its wings kept it from sinking. The student struggled throughout most of the semester. He attended class and completed his work, but he was so clearly lost that it was somewhat sad to see. Then, one day, after I had explained the structure of the galaxy to him countless times, he had a moment of sudden understanding. His eyes widened, and you could see the concept click in his mind. For the rest of the lab session, he was excitedly sharing with anyone who would listen just how vast the galaxy is. From that point on, he started coming to class early and staying after to ask questions. He ended up earning a B in the class and became one of my favorite students. One day, during a final exam, I noticed a student hiding paper under his exam. I could see the corner sticking out from where his exam was folded over the staple. I asked him what it was to ensure it wasn't a cheat sheet. He claimed it was scratch paper and it told him to make sure it was turned in with his exam. He looked a bit disappointed. When he turned in his exam, I noticed that his scratch paper only had the problems written down, including the problem numbers and instructions. He had planned to transcribe the test questions, take them to the bathroom for his girlfriend to answer, and then copy the answers back onto his exam. Story 11 During my first semester as a teacher, I encountered a student who struggled with even the most basic tasks. As we were discussing the final paper, she raised her hand to ask a question. 
She wanted to know how to create the space that appears before a new paragraph. I was taken aback and asked for clarification. She described it as the chunk of space before a paragraph begins, leaving the class momentarily speechless. I then asked if she meant an indent, to which she excitedly confirmed, explaining that she had never figured it out and had been using zeros and white font to create the space. I couldn't help but laugh at her ingenious yet misguided solution. I took the opportunity to introduce her and the class to the tab key, which solved her formatting issue. Another memorable student was a young man who frequently interrupted my lectures as if we were having a casual conversation. His interjections were often grandiose claims about his abilities or completely unrelated to the topic at hand. For instance, while I was explaining the rhetorical triangle, attributing its origins to Aristotle, he would interject with comments about gyros or claim to be an expert in philosophy, despite failing the introductory course twice. I had to remind him multiple times each class to not talk over me and to save his questions for after the lecture. His behavior extended beyond mere interruptions. He also refused to participate in any in-class assignments or group projects, preferring to play on his phone instead. This student did not submit any work throughout the entire quarter. On one occasion, he handed me a piece of paper with two handwritten paragraphs, claiming it was the essay that was due two weeks prior. This was for a college-level class where the assignment required a typed 1,500-word minimum essay. He then proceeded to argue with me about the concept of due dates, both via email and after class, insisting that nothing in class should have a due date. Despite his disruptive behavior, lack of participation, and failure to submit any assignments, he had the audacity to complain to my department head, claiming that my class was unfair because it didn't accommodate his preference for turning in work whenever he felt like it, disregarding due dates entirely. Story 12 This introductory English prose fiction course was designed to ensure that students, many of whom were international, had a sufficient level of English to succeed. In the first two weeks, they had to complete a diagnostic assignment worth 2% of their grade, this assignment also helped me understand a student's prior experience and familiarity with literature, guiding the comparative references I could use in lectures. After class, Mike lingered and approached me. He expressed resentment at having to take the course, insisting he was too intelligent and accomplished for it. To prove his point, he offered to show me a manuscript of a poetry book he'd written about his recent breakup. This course had no connection to poetry, neither in studying nor writing it. Poetry writing wasn't a substitute for analyzing prose passages. I felt uncomfortable with the idea of reading his personal breakup poetry and politely declined. Mike never returned to class and I assumed I wouldn't have to deal with him again. However, he remained enrolled and ended up with a 2 over 100 grade at the end of the term. I was surprised when, three days before the final exam, he emailed, demanding a medical exemption from the exam and all semester assignments. It wasn't just seeking to have the class not count against him, he wanted a passing grade despite his absence and lack of completed assignments. I refused his request. He appealed to my department chair, who also said no. He then went to the faculty dean, who also denied his request. Finally, he took it to the school-wide administration, who told him no and warned that further notions could lead to his removal. I wasn't kept in the loop after that, and my life was better for not having to worry about it. Well, if you like these stories, here's more. YouTube thinks you're going to love this. Catch you in that video.